everybody. Thanks for staying for our last panel. We are really delighted to have John Zimmer here with us from Lyft. John, I waited a, uh, about an hour today for a taxi a uh, couple of times. Um, Uber, of course, has been banned here. You guys have decided to pull out as well. It's just a very hostile environment for you guys. What is the state of regulatory play? Is there going to be any relief anytime soon? Uh, I believe in a few weeks, uh, there's, there's two bills that are coming up. One is around insurance, and the other is around uh, whether or not these new services can operate in Nevada. Uh, so I think there'll be a, a, a big deciding factor over the next couple of weeks. But this, this is something that we've seen you know, since day one, uh, you know, when we launched Lyft just about two and a half years ago. Uh, within uh, two months, we received a cease and desist from California. Wow. Uh, and Talk about your regulatory strategy. You know, Uber's been a lot more publicly pugnacious. Yeah. Are you kind of happy to be sort of behind them doing the hard blocking and tackling, or are you doing stuff on your own? Yeah, I think w one thing that people don't realize is that when, when we got started two and a half years ago, uh, you know, at the time, uh, Uber was just black cars. Right? right. And no one had really created a service for people to use their personal vehicles uh, to share rides. And so, uh, what we were doing was, I would, I would argue, a much more extreme uh, and, and a bigger change uh, for existing regulations. And so we had to take, you know, we had to take a tack that was true to who we were, but also, uh, you know, different given the, the extreme nature of what we were trying to do. Uh, and so uh, we, we started operating. Uh, we got the cease and desist. We went in and talked to them. Uh, and we said, you know, what, what is most important to you? Is it... Uh, is it safety or is it protecting the interests of the existing industry? And they said, safety, of course. And we said, well, great, we set up our safety system to be more strict than what you require, uh, that when any black car, any taxi requires any carpooling service. And so um, if it's about safety, why don't you just make sure we're doing what we're doing and create a new category? Um, and they said, no thanks at first, <laughs> and, and, and we got louder, uh, but, but eventually we, we made progress. But it's, uh, I'd say it's more our style to, to try to be collaborative uh, and then, uh, but stay strong and firm. And so what we've now been able to do is create over 30 new rules and regulations across the United States in, in about a, a year and a half. Cool. So where are you valued now, roughly speaking? What's your valuation at this point? Uh, so we, we just closed uh, another round of financing uh, over $500 million uh, at a $2.5 billion valuation. So that's quite a bit less than your competitor. What's the... What's the vision for you in sort of both catching up, surpassing them? How do you, how do, you do that? Yeah, so, so one, again, Lyft's been around for about just over two years. And so yeah. I think, you know, getting to over $2 billion in two years is, is pretty exciting. And to be fair, also, you don't operate <laughs> internationally. So yeah. um, that is a is sort of obviously a difference in, in revenue potential for right now, right? So. Yeah, yeah. So you were focused on the U.S. And... Um, and, and, and the vision for Lyft, I mean, they, they said it at the beginning, is we want to replace the need to own a car. And we, we never set out to be a better taxi. We never set out to be a black car. We never set out to be a private driver. We set out to completely change uh, the way people think about getting around, uh, in, in specifically in the US. And, and what I think is happening now is there's the opportunity, something we're all living through, is at the scale of a modern industrial revolution where when you look back in time and you think about what the you know, trains did for, for transport, they did in, you know, partially for consumers, but uh, you know, mostly for industry. Uh, we're about to have a similar kind of uh, modern industrial revolution uh, where you will not need to own a car. Uh, and we believe in about t 10, 10 plus years, uh, you know, there will be major gains in transportation as a service, the category that you know, that we're in versus car ownership. Do you think that's true only in urban areas or, or do you I think, think it'll start first in urban areas and it will, it will start primarily, you know, first with millennials that haven't bought a car. You're right. seeing, you know, over 20% reduction uh, with millennials in miles driven, uh, you know, in the last decade. Yep. Uh, and so I think it'll happen with, with younger generations in urban areas first. You now have sort of started to iterate on your model in a couple of different ways. Yeah. Um, you've changed a little bit of the sort of culture. You had the big pink mustache on the front of the car. You had the fist bumps yeah. um, sitting in the front, all of that. You kind of moved forward. Talk about what the philosophy was behind all of that. Yeah, so, so 
in school, I studied hospitality, and so uh, I've always been interested in uh, you know, designing any solution with the, you know, the customer or the person in mind. Uh, and, and also, we realized in the beginning, you know, we, wanted to, we wanted to have fun, but also we were getting people, again, you know, there are two things your mom tells you never to do, take a ride with strangers or take candy from strangers, right? <laughs> uh, and so we, we had a high, a high, high bar when we were launching. You know, no one had ever done these you know, rides in personal vehicles before. And so, you know, it's not aspirational to like sit in the back seat of someone's Honda Civic and, and you know, that's just not aspirational. And so, uh, you know, for us, the, the biggest uh, market is, is people that are already going the same way, uh, people that are sharing rides and the design of that <coughs> solution from a kind of what people, where people sit and what people do is sitting up front. Um, we put the pink mustache on the car really as a launch tactic at the beginning to get attention. Uh, it was supposed to be something we did for a few weeks. It lasted uh, a little over a year, um, and now we have a new version. Right. Um, but it was all about kind of uh, making people think about getting in a lift, not getting in a person, someone else's vehicle, a stranger's car, uh, and about uh, you know treating you know one other point is treating drivers with respect, right? And so if if you know I am a Lyft driver, and if I had more time, I'd drive more on Lyft. Uh, but when I drive for Lyft and, and someone sits next to me, it feels completely different than when I sit in the back seat. And, and our belief is that um, you know, the passengers should be able to sit wherever they want, but there's a larger population of people in this audience and in the, in the world that are willing to be you know, the friend with a car rather than everyone's private driver. And at some point, you're gonna hit a supply, which is a driver uh, you know, wall if you're only focused on you know, turning everyone into a taxi driver. You've also launched Hotspots, yeah. talk about how that works and where you see that going in the future. Yeah, so if you think about this, what I just said, like this modern industrial revolution, uh, the biggest difference is how fast you can do things you know, with uh, operating systems like iOS uh, or Android. And so a few weeks ago, we basically launched a uh, bus transit system in San Francisco uh, you know, in a day. And what I mean by that is we created 100 hotspots, which are like virtual bus stops. And the point of a bus stop is to accumulate a lot of people in one place so that you, you, you only need to make a few stops and you transport the most people. Uh, with hotspots, we're doing the same thing uh, where we've created these 100 different you know, street corners throughout uh, San Francisco to accumulate demand uh, for our new product, LiftLine. And LiftLine is, is a shared ride where right. if two people or three people or four people request a lift that's along the same route, we'll match them up and provide a savings to everyone and reduce the number of cars on the road. So do you not bother to use the app then in that case? Do you just go to this hotspot and there are lift cars there or? No, no, you need to use the app. Uh, you know, you request a LiftLine and when you're putting in where you are, uh, it suggests you're near a hotspot, save money by walking a couple blocks. We made 100 hotspots so that for anyone in San Francisco that lives in kind of the main part of San Francisco, right. you're within a three minute walk uh, from a hotspot. And how is it doing? How is it's it going working? really well. The, the key metric, uh, a couple of key metrics. One, San Francisco now, our rides after just a few months, Lift Line, which is the shared ride, uh, is the majority of all rides in San Francisco now. Really? Uh, versus Lyft, which is where you get you know, single party, single car. Uh, so that's extremely exciting. Uh, and then what you see with hotspots is the match rate, meaning the number of times that you get a match or multiple matches has gone up uh, as we've concentrated demand. There was a lot of controversy over the sort of higher price at, at peak hours, more congestion. You need to obviously recruit more drivers. Yeah. Um, it's, down, it's dying down a little bit, but I still hear a lot of pushback on that. Yeah. Um, is there something that might evolve there, or do you feel like you just always have to be in that supply and demand mode algorithmically where you're going to need to do that in order to keep the driver's commission at, at a certain level? Yeah, so uh, the important thing to, to passengers you know, that data shows is that uh, when they open the app, they can get a, a ride and they can get it under five minutes. Right? And so, uh, and you can think about this kind of like, uh, you know, we're building Verizon and AT&T. Uh, right now. We're building the network. You need to have a certain number, three bars of coverage in order to use the service. You need to get, you know, three minutes ETAs. Yep. Um, and so, uh, where was I going? Where so, was you, I, so you felt like you need to maintain this kind of... Yeah, yeah, so sorry. The, the, yeah. the pricing is super important because 
uh, if you don't do that, if you don't have some degree of dynamic pricing, then you're unable to to get that, that, that th three bars or that three minute ETA yeah. um, at the peak times. Because you have times on the weekend that are extremely, you know, much higher, 10 times more demand than, you know, a weekday at noon. Um, that said, we don't think you need to go to an extreme, uh, you know, that others have gone to, because at that point, you're actually not increasing supply. Right. Uh, and you're, you know, doing something to customers, which we think is, is going too far. What do you offer drivers to either come to you or stay with you as opposed to going to the competition? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have a few different programs. We have, you know, power driver bonuses. So for drivers that drive more, they keep more of the money. Uh, we have uh, tips on the platform. Right, uh, which is which, a big difference which, for which the no, driver. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. The others don't have. And, and so, uh, and that, that relates to service too. You know, when, when drivers have the ability to, you know, get an extra dollar or two uh, on a trip, uh, it also leads to, to higher quality service. And then a lot of drivers, there was a recent survey um, that uh, I believe it was 48 out of 50 drivers said that drive for both preferred driving on Lyft uh, because their passengers treat them better. Mm. Um, and so I think that goes back to the way we design the experience. So it's been just a nonstop slugfest over drivers, better even than the fight that happened here last Sunday night, I would say. Um, what, what's, I mean, you know, I hear stories of there are bars where drivers congregate and both sides send people in and try to recruit and you have the, you know, the, the, the mass rallies and the food trucks and everything else. I mean, how, how much of your time and money are you having to spend on recruiting drivers? I mean, there's, there's two things uh, that, you know, the two most important things in our business in this like two-sided marketplace are, are drivers and passengers. Right. Uh, so, you know, half of, half of most teams' time is spent at least uh, on drivers. And is it, is it some sort of marketing or do you really have to sort of go in and go after the competition's drivers in order to make progress? Um, there's so many people that haven't used either service yet uh, from a driver and passenger perspective mm -hmm. uh, that there's still a lot of new territory, but um, there's, there's also drivers that have tried another service, were unhappy with it, uh, and, and are coming over to our service. And do you, you have some sort of a rating system, right, by the user for the driver. Yep. How much feedback does the driver get if I rate the driver poorly, yeah. does that driver understand that I've given them a poor rating after the fact? Uh, no, the driver does not see your rating, so Never it's, see it's that. anonymous. Yeah. But do you give feedback to the driver saying, gee, you got yeah. a bad... So weekly, we, we, we provide feedback to the driver so they can see you know, any ride that you got under five stars, uh, you'll see you got you know, this many four stars. And then we ask the passenger why uh, they didn't get five stars. And you can leave a comment that gets anonymously passed through. Um, or you can flag something like navigation, you know, friendliness, something like that, and, yep. and that gets passed through as well. And so when I get into a car, does the driver know, because they know who I am, right? I've, I've ordered the car. Yep. Do they know that I'm somebody that has given bad reviews in the past? That, uh, I, might the be a, that I might be a tough customer? Uh, no, we, tr we try not to, I mean, we, you do, they do see your overall rating. They don't see any of the comments that anyone has left you. Okay. So out of a five-star rating, you know, you can see. Do the drivers rate the passengers as yeah, well? Yeah, it goes both they ways. They do, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, and do you ever get back to passengers and say, Absolutely. sorry, and you well, cut them off sometimes? Yeah, so, you know, we have a, a trust and safety team and, and we have a really smart system that can see on any comments left by a driver, uh, if, if there are certain keywords that we, fla we have flagged, and this is automated, uh, or you know, if we see a one-star rating, it will automatically create a ticket for our trust and safety team, and, and we will follow up on that. Do you imagine moving into other logistical areas that use the car in ways that you know, some of your competitors have been talking about doing, whether it's delivering dry cleaning or uh, something like that? I mean, is that on your roadmap, or are you kind of really going to focus on the car and we're, the we're primarily riders. focused on on people yep. uh, versus objects uh, and uh, you know that said you know what we believe is happening in cities over the next 10 years is you know going to be the largest physical you know transformation of our cities because of these new forms of transportation meaning that you probably won't need as many roads uh, you know you're going to have uh, uh, you don't need parking parking lots um, and as you build up this Verizon, AT&T type network, 
uh, there will be the ability to run uh, other things on it, lo logistics being one of them, packages being, being, being yep. one of them. But yep. um, we believe that as we continue to innovate in transportation, you know, with lift line, with hotspots, uh, so that we can help uh, get everyone out of their cars, uh, that that is the best uh, focus and path forward. Uh, because things like LiftLine, where you have multiple people, uh, you know, could be similar solutions to having multiple packages. Do you imagine so, a world of autonomous vehicles? Yeah, I also? think I think that that is uh, inevitable. Um, that that this will happen. Uh, I think the timeline is is very debated. Um, you know, but if it's if it's 10 years, 15, 20 years out, uh, the implications for our cities. You know, uh, we hope before that that we can eliminate traffic, but that will certainly eliminate traffic. Uh, it will also make, you know, at least I would guess half the roads unnecessary, you know, all the parking lots unnecessary. But if uh, there's all more Lyft and Ubers and all those, the, the, there'll still be a lot of cars, right? Yeah, but Lyft line, you know, when you get one match with one other right. person is, is right. one car instead of two. Right. So I want to go back to valuation and just the valley in general right yeah. now. Um, you know, who's to say you're overvalued or undervalued, but there are companies that are hugely valued right now. Um, and there's beginning to be more concern that if not a bubble, we have this membrane around us and it's expanding. Yeah. What's your view of the state of things right now? I mean, you're continuing to raise money, I presume, and some companies are just, they're, they're open about saying we're raising money because we can. Yeah. And, and uh, it's sort of not clear what they're doing with those funds. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think it's harder to kind of make an overall statement about, about everything, and it's, it's you know, easier. We can look at our specific situation or, or other specific situations. I think, in general, you know, this modern industrial revolution is real, is happening. There are things that couldn't be done before. Um, you know, if, if, again, if two and a half years ago we told people that millions of people every month would be riding in each other's cars, people would have said that that's, that's not going to happen. And so um, I do think that there is legitimate, le legitimate like large, large businesses being built now. Um, I think that uh, for certain companies, it does make sense to raise capital. I think we are one of them because it is expensive to build up our cell towers, which is our, you know, uh, our Driver density, yep. drivers and passengers yep. in, in multiple cities. Um, and because we have a well-funded competitor. Um, but I don't think that's true for everyone. I think we were, li we were listening to the, the last talk, uh, and for certain people uh, that don't need it, I, I, I think you, know, you, you don't need to, to get do there. You, do you imagine a world, I mean, is this a Hertz Avis world that we're heading into where there's basically two companies in the ride-sharing business that are the, the, the only players that can really survive? Or do you imagine that there could be multiple uh, operators doing this kind of business, even in some cases at a local level, which is what we're seeing internationally now. Yeah, I think in the US, I think it's becoming more and more clear that there are, there are two players. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, given the amount of capital we've raised, uh, that it would be difficult for, for more players to get, you know, get up to that, that critical right. mass. Right. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's the likely, likely path here in the US. Yep. What, uh, what's keeping you up at night right now? Um, I think the two, two things, you know, historically I always think about, uh, you know, the, the company's culture as, as we grow. Uh, you know, we went from uh, 30 people uh, just over, just about, yeah, two years ago to, to now 430 people. Wow. Uh, and, and that's so, not including the drivers, right? Those correct. are contract yeah, workers. Over yeah, over 100,000 right. drivers on the platform. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so but, but both, you know, maintaining and, and improving culture you know, when you go from 30 to 430 or, uh, you know, 1,000 to 100,000 drivers uh, is something I, I think a lot about. So what are you, do, I mean, what are you doing about it? Do you have more meetings? Do you talk We're more with your Try not to have too many meetings, Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we've, we've instilled different things at the company. So uh, drivers are very important to, to the employees that work at the company. And so whenever we have a, a, a team meeting every, every two weeks, we typically have a, a, a story uh, about uh, drivers or passengers uh, interactions that have happened because mm -hmm. of Lyft. Uh, you know, so we have stories about, uh, there's two drivers that one was a, a mentor, we have this mentor program and uh, met, uh, met his wife 
uh, who's another driver and now getting married and having a kid. Nice. Uh, and so uh, I think helping, you know, as you grow and in this digital world, uh, I think it's important to remember all the people that are being affected by, by the business. And so I think we've, we've done a, a decent job of, of reminding our team why we're doing this, who we're doing this for. So um, speaking of affecting the people or, or helping the people who are affected, what is your vision for what the legal status of your drivers should be? Are they contract workers? Do they qualify for medical insurance? I mean, what, what's your, in your mind where this needs to go? So I think I have to be careful because I think there's ongoing litigation. Okay. Um, but uh, I think uh, there, I think taxi, taxi businesses historically have been even independent contractors and they've required you to use a certain vehicle and to show up at certain times. Uh, you know, and here you have something where it's totally on your own time right. whenever you want. Right. Uh, and I think there, you know, are, 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 are many that would say they, they, they like that flexibility. Um, and so I, I guess the, the best answer I give is, is maybe there's not a, uh, a, you know, a shoe that fits today, given, you know, that it's, there's, there's two different things. Uh, and maybe what needs to happen at a bigger level uh, as more and more of these uh, businesses are, are being created and, and more and more kind of different type of work is being created, maybe you know, the country should look at uh, what is the right uh, new category. Um, as we think about kind of our drivers as part of our community, uh, we should always be, you know, as one of our customers in a sense, we should always be doing uh, everything we can you know, that is legal to, um, to support them in, in what they're doing. What's the most important thing you want these people to remember about Lyft right now? Uh, that we're just getting started, uh, that, that the vision is, you know, maybe, maybe we're chapter two of 10, uh, and that, uh, you know, we, we really want to get uh, people uh, away from car ownership uh, and, and into hopefully shared lifts um, so that they can get where they need to go uh, faster, more fun, uh, and at a lower price. Well, I wish you could get me to the airport tonight, but I'm yeah. gonna have to brave the line. Thank you, John Zimmer of Lyft. Appreciate it. Thanks.